Hey everybody, welcome to LA Times. Today we have a special guest. We have Dino, our main man right there. Great, great guy. Um, we're going to be talking about his uh, his story, about his life. We're going to be talking about his testimony. Uh, but today on the show, uh, we got Paul, which is the host. We got Sunny Boy right there with uh, Scraggin, guys. Yeah, the Street Tain Loyal podcast. If you guys, you know, check him out. And then we have Dino right here. Dean, we're going to get on with his story. We're going to talk about his testimony. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. I appreciate you guys uh, joining us today. And don't forget, give us a like, give us a subscribe, you know, go ahead, talk to your family, talk to your friends, you know, send them over to listen to uh, all the postings we have uh, going on right now on the podcast. Hey, Dino, I thank you for joining us today. I thank you. You know, we just want to talk about your, your story of uh, being from uh, TMC, um, Eastside, the mob crew, and how uh, you're one of the founding members of that of that gang from L.A., from the Liso Village uh, housing projects. Yeah. And uh, we just want to talk about that, how it got started, and, and, and how you came into that life. Yeah, well, I grew up in the Aliso Village housing projects in Boyle Heights, East L.A., and... Um, as a kid, you know, growing up there, you know, we grew up with like all types of different races. And um, we didn't see any color when it came to, you know, cause we had blacks there, we had Orientals, we had some whites and it was just a mixture of families there. And, and, and we didn't see any color lines. You know, we, we, we were blinded to that because we, we were born to, to, to each other. So um, like in 83, 84, when the break dancing started coming coming about, I got like really heavy into it. I, uh, I was pretty good at it, and and we decided to start a, a breakdancing crew. So um, <clears throat> we got the, the name called the Mob Crew. Uh, you know, there hence the crew part of the uh, of the name. So you know, years passing, we started breakdancing. We're like really good. We're breakdancing against like different crews all over, all over like LA, Venice Beach. I mean, everywhere we would go everywhere and breakdance and stuff. So you know, come you know doing that, and I don't want to be um, like glorifying us but we were really good so we were beating a lot of people when it came to competitions and stuff like that and and so that that started like a lot of people having like you know, animosity towards us and 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 wanting to fight with us so so and us being kids from the projects you know we grew up i mean i'm talking as little kids you know fighting all the time so it was nothing new for us so we kind of welcomed it you know and and we didn't care about, you know, the fighting part about it, but it started happening like immediately. Like we started fighting with different people and, 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 you know, little by little, we started growing, growing, growing. And, and then it just didn't become a, a, a gang, you know, it was, a, it became like a, 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 a solid gang. And, and we started getting into like everything. We dabbled in everything after. So it started off as something positive, uh, break dancing and, I remember in that culture, um, break dancing was to settle disputes or to go against somebody like, hey, we could like uh, have like a dance off type thing. And then whoever won was the winner. But I know things then after that, people were, there were like sore losers and stuff like that, that things wound up being fights and stabbings and shootings. And then everything escalated to where uh, the little crews, kind of like with the taggers. You yeah, know what I mean, that the tagging crews all up becoming cliques also or gangs, and I know like the breaking crews did too. Yeah, and, and that that's the the real part about it was that we really enjoyed doing what we were doing. I love to break dance and and, and pop, and I, I love to to show people what I can do, and so, you know my other friends also. So our hearts were in the right place, but you know we got challenged in a different you know matter, and and, and like I said, us being from the projects, I mean. They, they weren't gonna they were we weren't gonna back down either and and it just evolved to that it evolved to you know something big it became you know a big a big force when it came to other issues you know and we'll get into that in a little bit yeah and i remember um you showed me a magazine that you were in yeah i was in a few magazines and um i think um um i had got called for actually i got called for a commercial to be, be in a commercial i don't remember what it was but uh, uh, I think I had fell in love for the first time or something. And I got so hurt that I left to Guadalajara with, with my grandmother. And at that time when I was gone, they were looking for me for, um, for this, um, 
for this commercial and I missed that that boat. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think the, the magazine you showed me, you were doing like the spider. Yeah, the spider, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was crazy. Looking. I, I was pretty popular for that, that move right there, because I used to do the spider and spin on my back from the spider to, to my head. And I had to make funny faces. So people were like, it caught on and people like started noticing me and stuff, you know, because of the breakdown thing. And I had different, you know, different guys from the neighborhood had their different thing. Like I had my friend um, Richie Ortiz, rest in peace, sniper. He was a good popper, you know. I got had my friend Joseph Price. He was a good break dancer. Everybody had their their thing, so it made our crew really strong, you know. So, yeah. so like at that time, um, you said it was like 82, 83, right? So what were you like, 12, 13 years old? So yeah, from like eighty two, yeah, I was twelve. I just told my age right now, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> like at twelve years old, you were into break dancing, living in the projects. And, and were you raised by your mom and your dad or? I was just raised by my mom. And, and at that time, at 12 years old, I was already getting in trouble. You know, the, the breakdown team was, like you said, was more of a positive thing. But I'm talking at least by the age of, I mean, I, I can't even remember, maybe seven years old, eight years old, I already started getting into trouble. And, and I remember one time, I think I was like nine years old, I had broken into a a factory, me and a couple friends broke into this factory because in the projects right near the project, there's like tons of factories. So we broke into this factory and we stole all this leather material and all this stuff. And we're thinking we're doing a good thing by taking this material to take it home because we were really poor to take it home to our parents to make, you know, whatever they could make. My mom was a, a really great sewer, so was my grandmother. So my intentions were, I'm going to take this to my mom and then uh, she'll sew something up or whatever it was. But no, it didn't work on my favor or my brother and sister because she ended up making whips for to, to whip us with them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I ended up getting in trouble. Um, one of one of the guys, I mean, we were young, so he ended up telling on us and and the cops came to the house and and they didn't arrest me, but they told my mom that they, you know, they need to put a stop to this now because, you know, he's going to end up, you know, worse. And my mom didn't put a stop to it. So my mom calmly said, do you know, go take a shower. Everything's all right. You're not in trouble. So I was like, what? Like, I'm, I'm nine years old. So I'm thinking, oh, okay. So and in the project, we don't have showers. It was just a, a bathtub. So I go in the, in the bathtub and I close the door. I go in the bathtub and I'm playing with my toys inside, of, you know, the water, whatever I was doing. And then my mom kicks in the door like she's like Clint Eastwood. Boom. And she's standing there. And all I can remember, it, it sounded like the movie like that. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah. and she started her with this look and i knew it oh man i'm gonna get it and yeah i i i paid for that one and, and so yeah she 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 gave me a good one that night and yeah. so, but that wasn't the first or the last time i got in trouble but yeah like the breakdancing part of it was just something positive you know because for for a long time i mean we were doing fine but you know as we got better and you know like i said beating all these crews they, they just it just turn into you know fights and stuff and, and that's where the beginning really was that's where we started like you know people wanted to be in our crew and and people weren't breakdancing they were just coming in and we got bigger everybody from different sides of the projects because in the projects keep in mind it's like 28 29 acres of land so on one end of the projects off of forestry you had cuatro flats and then it was us tmc and then tmc again and then you had east la's on one side i mean you had all these gangs in the project so everybody was warring you know later on in years you know everybody started warring against each other and it became like a really bad area bad battle battleground well would you literally say, would you say that you remember that defining like that day that you stopped being a break dancer and what you beat there was the day you became the gang member i mean to be honest with you joe i think um I think immediately we didn't actually say we were a gang, but it, it already felt like it. So I think maybe, you know, in the first few months of us doing it, you know, we consider us like, like if the little rascals, you know, the little rascals used to all hang out and that's how we were. But, you know, we grew up and it, it was like, like family, like any other gang, it felt like a family, you know, and, and, and you know, we had absent, some of the guys had absent parents. Cause I really don't remember 
any of my friends, I really can't recall any of my friends having a dad except for my friend Walter. And he was from the hood too, but he did really good for his life also. He, you know, he went to college after and, you know, he did really good. And, and I think that kind of proves a little bit that um, having a father would, would have made a, a bigger difference in my life and, and other kids' lives in the projects, you know, having that father figure, somebody to, to lead you and guide you and even give you that, that good butt whipping, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's still fear, huh? Hey, yeah. uh, you know. Yes, sir. I'm real familiar with the, the the project, so I know exactly what you're talking about. I know the diagrams. I know with the neighborhoods. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah we're not too far from you. I always wondered how you guys got established in Aliso with so many different neighborhoods being there. Because there's probably about, I want to say maybe 10, 15 different gangs in that. There, there, were, there were like eight different gangs in the project. And and I think um, at that time, when we had started TMC, um, uh, you know how gangs, are, it's like a roller coaster, right? It gets really active and then it goes down. And then it gets active again. It's just the different generations of people that come along. So I think around at that time, the generation of the activity wasn't, wasn't really too, too harsh. So uh, we didn't have these other bigger gangs telling us, you can't do it or you're going to be from our hood or be a clique. So we didn't really have that because we, we started as a breakdancing crew. So nobody really, um, uh, really, you know, said anything about it. So, you know, that's how we were able to slide by, but then we started getting into the, the, the you know, the dope game and, and we started getting pretty powerful for being a smaller gang than everybody else and everybody else was bigger than us. So, yeah. So that's was, how we were able to slide in. Was there any other, uh, Breaking crews that, that came out of Aliso, or were you guys? No, it was just everybody from from every side. You know, we had guys from from Cuatro to Primera to you know uh, whatever gangs were there. They were joined into the the crew until later on in the years they started going you know to their side or their family side. So yeah, we, that's how we. There was really only us down there. Did any of those neighborhoods get along? In the beginning, yeah, we got along with like with Cuatro Flats. Um, uh, we got along with them pretty good. Uh, the East LA's, you know, you know, but in time things just started happening. Yeah, yeah, it always happens. Yeah, usually it's because of Haina. Yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, I get the territories, it. you know. Yeah, who's the strongest? Who's the biggest? You know. Okay, so if we're going from the break dancing, then you guys uh, created the TMC, the the gang, right? The yeah. Mako, East Side. So what happened after that? How old were you? Like, were you 13 when you became like, when you started starching and increasing? And... Yeah, it, it was about around that time, 13 years yeah. old, 14, 15. We started like really going to like house parties or, or the school dance, like Holland back um, junior high school dances and stuff. And, and then you had, you know, different other gangs that would go to and that's where it started really, you know, popping. Things started happening at the dances and fighting, and it was not shooting, no shooting yet. Not not yet. Yeah. So what age would you say when you lost your first homeboy? Uh, the first one, I believe it was in, I want to say, I want to say 89 or 90, which, which was my friend Richie Ortiz, um, Sniper. Yeah. Okay, he was the first. He got shot. And now... Um... TMC is not just the uh, mob crew. It's like the, Mich the Michigan club, the um, the magician. Michigan. Yeah, we're we're a different entity. Yeah, they're yeah. I know ones in Hollywood, the magicians. Um, did you ever catch flack from from? Um, oh yeah, we we, we got into it with them. You got into it more with a name, correct? Uh, yeah, and it was over some guy who knew them also, but he was from the project, and he was just causing conflict and. And yeah, we got into it a couple of times, a few times with them, not too many, but I think it was like two times that I could remember clearly that we actually got into it with them. Okay. Yeah. Cause um, like I said, I'm familiar with the area. So I know, um, I, I know the active gangs out there and um, I know it's pretty vicious in the projects. At least it was now it's, it's changed. Yeah. Um, but I know back in the day, my, um, my, my, my kid's mother actually worked at the clinic right there. Okay. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? On 4th Street, right? 4th yeah, or 1st? I think we had a couple, oh. yeah. On 4th, yeah. Yeah, that's Dr. Barnes' office. I don't know if it's still that, but... 
Yeah, well, my wife, well, my kid's mother did the, uh, her okay. internship there. So, oh, nice. Um, there was constantly shootings in the day, the night. It didn't matter what time. Oh, it um, didn't. That's how, did, how did you guys cope with that, the, the um, violence? Because you guys are right next to each other. Oh, yeah. We're like literally across the street, and, and, and our enemies were on the other side, and we were on this side. And yeah, we were actually in the middle of it all. The way we had guys coming from, even like from up the hill, you know, like uh, on Cesar Chavez, the guys from, you know, different neighborhoods up there would come down there. And I mean, we, we were catching it from everywhere. But, you know, when we started getting really established, we, we had so much firepower that, that I mean, they, they even wrote ads about us in LA Times that we were like the smallest gang there. But, you know, we had so much firepower because we were making so much money as young kids. We were able to, to buy all that stuff and, you know, it never letting them, letting everybody have it, you know. So we were able to defend ourselves because of that. And then we had a we had it pretty pretty structured too because we had like in the projects, you know, you know the projects how we have the roofs on the project. So we had it sold up where we had people on the roofs of walkie talkies and watching stuff to who was coming in, who was coming out. So we were prepared, and it was like we were prepared for war. And and, and I'm not saying that I was the one that was constantly out there because I, I really I wasn't. But, you know, a lot of the other homies were, you know, were wooded and then they had it sold up like where, where they took care of the neighborhood and, and, and they watched out, you know, for everybody. And then we had all the senoras in the project. So when we needed, you know, a safety zone to go run somewhere, the senoras in the projects are, are because we respected them, they would let us in their house to, to you know, to, to save us. So. Yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of people don't know that, that um, the senoras in, and then a lot of audios will sit there and they'll back your play. They'll let you in, cover up for you, do things for you just to keep you out of jail. Yeah, um, yeah. And that, it, that's just about respecting the, the people, you know, because, you know, they're in our area and, and, and their area too, because we don't own it, but we have to respect them that way. You know, when we see them, we tell them hi, we greet them or whatever it is, help them if we need to. And that's how we get the respect from them for for them to actually open the door for us. Cause who's really gonna open the door for somebody who's out there shooting and stuff, you know? And, yeah. and that's how, you know, and we, it's it, like I said, we grew up there since little kids. So it's like a big, big family. And I'm talking, like I said, it's a big project area. And, and but you know, everybody, everybody knows you and you know, everybody. Yeah, yeah. And so where do, where is the next step uh, from there? I'm sorry? No, go ahead, go ahead, Sonny. No, I was going to ask him when the racial start, the racial tension started with East Coast. I want to say about about 88, 89, maybe 90, 88, 89, yeah, about, about that time. And it all started, you know, because of, you know, political reasons and stuff. You know, our homies started going to jail and, and started realizing the game and, and what to do and what not to do, who you can hang out with and who you can't hang out. And it was kind of a shock to us because, you know, we weren't used to that, you know, and a lot of people, and this is something I want to stress that a lot of people think that we were called the mob crips and that, that was not it. That was definitely not it. It just that, like I said, we grew up with different races. So, I mean, for instance, if there was a whole gang of Vietnamese people, I'm sure they probably say because we hung out with them that we were a Vietnamese gang and that's just not what it was. It's just that we grew up in, in that environment and that's what we grew up in, you know? And we didn't start realizing, you know, the political as aspect of, of gangs until, you know, homies started going to prison and stuff. So I, I want to say 88 because 18, we're, you know, we're about 18 at that time. So people started be getting busted and maybe a little bit earlier going to YA and all that stuff. Not me, but a lot of the homies, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, but we definitely were not we were not Crips. Uh, you know, people want to confuse it because we were into hip hop, and and they might confuse our style of dressing because in that time we weren't dressing, you know, you know, with Ben Davis and all that. We were fila suits, and because we we're you know we were into that hip hop culture, you yeah, know, yeah. You, you know, and, and and we liked that style, the the Adidas and, and all that stuff because, we, you know, we love that culture and that's what we were. We were a breakdown. I wish we had films from it back then. It would have been, like, great to show, but that's what it was. It wasn't because we were Crips. We grew up amongst different races and that's just that, the bottom line. That was just, like we said, it was the time. It was the 80s. Exactly. It was breakdancing, dancing, the time of Run DMC, the time of uh, Puma and Adidas and, and stuff like that. So, and you guys were a breaking crew to start off, you know what I mean? 
Yeah. So, so well, uh, when did you guys get into the where you stopped doing that and started getting into the Dickies and? I say from like maybe from eighty eight to ninety, but maybe ninety where it hit hard. We're in the nineties where we started like the homies started wearing Ben Davis and and you know like really getting into it, you know, and, and being homies. Yeah. You know, like, like with that, that, that mindset. Yeah, nineties was. Uh, yeah, that's where it got bad. Yeah, it was active. It was really active. Um, but the, the late eighties was active too. That's what me, yeah. and Paul, me and Paul were out there in the in the late eighties. Yeah. Yeah, but um, man, that's just crazy times, you know, to think that you survived that. You know what I mean? That all of us survived those times. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, what was your next step after breakdancing? When did you get into like making money? Um. During the like, like I said, like between like '87 and, and and the rest of the years, that's where we started getting into the, the the you know doing our thing, you know making money and and we were I mean maybe not me because I was still not getting too much involved with it yet, but like the other homies that that were like younger than me and 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 they were making tons of money. These kids were driving around and. Brand new Cadillacs, Coupe de Ville. We were known for that. They had, we had a fleet of Coupe de Villes on uh, Dayton's, and and these are young kids. You know, it's like wow. People were like, you know, they knew what was going on, but I mean, we had, like I said, we had a fleet of Cadillacs and and, and making money and and buying web, weapons and like, jewelry. Like we had it all. Like we, we were making a lot of money for being such a young gang. And what what would I think what made us more respected was that we had a lot of solid homies. We had homies that were willing, willing to go, you know, the nine yards and do what we had to do to protect our neighborhood and had no fear because, you know, you grow up in a project, you, you learn to have no fear. You're used to it. You're used to waking up to gunshots. It's nothing to us. And I'm sure Sonny and, and Paul could relate to it too. That And you too, Joe, that, you know, once you get immune to something, you get immune, immune to, to death and, and, and and, and and violence i mean it just becomes part of you you know it just becomes part of you and it's, it's and nothing can you you have no fear you have no emotion you have no your heart turns really black and 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 sometimes you look forward to it like where i moved to now it's like so quiet here it's like sometimes i miss hearing those sounds and and the helicopters and it's just it's just weird you know I, i'm following god i'm a man of god now but you know sometimes i, I miss that environment and it's weird to say but it, yeah. it, it is what it is you know because it comes a bit, i really feel like it becomes a part of you like you wake up right you wake up you take a shower you eat breakfast and you continue your day and like when you live in the, the neighborhoods or the barrios the projects whatever it is um you get up you eat breakfast you hear gunshots you hear the police sirens you hear the helicopters and you do your day you know what i mean it's part of your routine you know what I mean? It's like uh, you go to bed and you say your prayers and you crash out. Right? And when you live in those conditions, you go to bed, you say your prayers and you listen to all the gunshots and tires screeching and uh, helicopters going by. And that's just the normal part of life. You know what I mean? That's kind of like your thing to fall asleep to. You know what I mean? Like yeah, listen yeah. to the fan to fall asleep. You're yeah, listening yeah. to the community. And, and sometimes like uh, we would hear the gunshots at night and we like me personally, I'd be so tired that I'd be like, ah, I'll find out who got killed tomorrow. Like it was just like that. And I'll give you another example of, of, of how, um, how cold we get to, to, to our feelings because there was a time that I had got, I think I went to the County for driving drunk or something. I don't know what it was. And the County jail is like really not that far from the project. So uh, bad part is that you got to, if you're walking home, you got to walk through all enemies' neighborhoods because it's on the way. So one time um, I got released early in the morning and, and, and I'm running. I'm trying to, you know, creep through, you know, through Mission and all the neighborhoods. So I finally get to my neighborhood and there's a, 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 li a little liquor store in the projects in my area. It's called Moon Store. So as I'm running down, um, um, uh, what is that street? I want to say Clarence. I believe it's Clarence, that street, we used to call it the Thai line because that's in the eighties, um, we used to, they used to sell Thai, Thai bud weed right there. So that was the nickname for that street. And it's known to this day as that street. So as I'm running down the Thai line, I get to, to where I'm gonna make a left to moon, where Moon Store is at. 
there's a guy dead. There's already people outside. There's a guy dead on the floor with his like his butt in the air, like if he was like like that, his face on the ground and his butt in the air, and he's like dead. I was so immune to death and 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 seeing this stuff that I didn't even I looked and kept running because all I could think about it, I wanted to go home and go take a shower and eat. I didn't care about what I saw right there because it was like whatever to me. It was like, it's like if somebody walking over somebody who's laid out on the floor and, and that's exactly what I did. I just kept running. I looked, oh, okay. I'll find out who it is later. And, yeah. you know, I didn't recognize them from my quick glance because I know all the homies really well. So I, I figured it was an enemy or something. So I just kept going. So. I later on found out, but, but yeah, that, that's how immune you get to death in the project and in, in any neighborhood. Yeah. I think like uh, anybody else out there, they would see that and it would traumatize them. They would be like thinking about it all night, wondering who, who it was, what happened. And they were like, you know what I mean? For a long time, they'd be talking about it with everybody because you don't see that every day for the average person. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, yes, sir. Uh, like when you grow up in the body or the project, like you're saying, like, that's just, yeah, that's normal. That's like a dog running by you. It's like, okay, that's everyday sight. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's and normal. It's normal. Or seeing somebody with a gun or shots being fired, it just becomes, yeah, and it's sad. But it did, at the same time, you think like, okay, this is normal, but it's not normal. And it does affect you. Like later, later on, when you get out of that, you're thinking like, man, what did I go through? What did I survive? You know what I mean? And it makes you realize that, man, that wasn't normal. That, yeah, that. And it's not because I mean, speaking to that same person uh, later in years, like I, I have these nightmares and, and, and um, I dreamt about it. You know, I dreamt out of several times about that day running through there. So in reality, I thought it didn't affect me, but it did. Everything that happened to me in those projects affected my, my mind, it affected my soul, it, it affected my heart these nightmares that I have. And then lately they haven't, I don't know if it's God working through me and he's, he's taking these nightmares from me, but I have these horrible nightmares and my girl's always telling me that she hears me screaming and, and then I'm talking about shoot them, shoot them and all this stuff, kill them. And, and I'm saying all this stuff like clearly. And, and, um, you know, she, it's hard for her to wake up with me cause I wake up swinging and, and, and coming back to that, those dreams about that guy, like it, it affects me. Every, everything that I saw, I've dreamt about it. And, and, and it was like an ongoing thing for, we're talking 20 something years or more, having these nightmares and, and, and I didn't know how to, 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 to cure it. You know, I don't know how, because this is something that's internal that really affected my mind. And, and a lot of these youngsters don't realize that this life, it, 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 it's not the way to go, bro. It's not. Because not normal human beings don't, yeah, don't be shooting at each other or, or killing each other or, or attacking each other the way we do. Yes, sir. Not normal. Uh, a lot of people talk about getting shot. I've been shot twice. Yeah. But, um, most people have never even heard a bullet. Never, n never been around a bullet to get shot at. Um, but a fortune you have, I know, in the projects, it's more prevalent there. Yeah, I've been, I've been shot a few times. Now, uh, what's your interaction with uh, Father Greg Boyle? I know that's probably one of your uh, main oh, questions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just talking to him today, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm actually writing a song for him. I'm going to do a whole full-blown song for him. I just talked to him about it and got his okay to do it. And I want to try to go there when he gets some time to get an interview and get some footage of him so I can put it on the video. Because that's my next project after these two that I'm doing right now. So, um, yeah, me and Father Greg, we go back from... I mean, way from when he started coming to the projects and stuff like, like when he first came, we, we didn't trust him. We thought he was a cop. We thought he was an undercover cop because there was also this guy selling hot dogs and with a little hot dog um, truck. And he, he was an undercover cop. And it's the same thing we thought about Father Greg, you know, this guy wasn't real. This guy wasn't, he wasn't who he said he was. He wasn't trying to help us. This guy's probably undercover. And, and, but no, you know, Father Greg was real. And, and to this day, he's a big part of my life. Yeah, Father Greg, um, boy, when I well, actually when I paroled, I went to Homeboy Industries. Okay. And I got turned away because I wasn't from Aliso. It was I like, think a lot of people sorry. felt that way. He told me, I'm sorry. 
Um, but right now, my primary concern is Aliso, and that's all I got funding for right now, and that's all I can do for. And he goes, those are my kids. I'm, I'm going to try to tell him because he used to tear him up when he was uh, doing funerals for you guys. Yeah. He, yeah, so um, I, I think in the beginning, um, it was like that. Yeah. I, I can't really speak on it, but I think it was because his focus was there because he was the, the church um, pa um, a priest there. So that was his parish. So that was his whole surrounding. So I think he was focused on that. So now come to, to 21, you know, it expanded so big. It's the biggest gang intervention in the world. So it expanded so big. So he was able to get that funding to help everyone out. So I really believe, Sonny, that his intentions were not to um, turn people away, but his focus was to, to get a solid foundation to expand. And I think his goal was achieved by, by starting from that area and then making it big. So we're yeah. here. No, I, I, I completely agree. I, I didn't hold any animosity towards the man. He, he explained to me very clearly when I, when I had spoke to him, he goes, I wish I could help you right now, but I got to take care of my kids. Cause that's what he used to call you guys. As far yeah. as I heard was your, I still your that. Yeah. And, um, his primary, and, and he only had like a small funding so I know he was all Eliso because I know a lot of guys from that area. So they would all get action when they went there. Yeah. And I know now, because I've been to Homeware Industries uh, to visit people that I know, and um, they got everybody from everywhere now. Oh, yeah. All, Back, all kind of people. At the time, it was, it was specifically just Eliso. You guys yeah, I know. I know when he started, like, you know, getting jobs for the, for the homies, uh, sometimes he didn't even know where he was going to get the money to pay everybody, you know? And, and I think I heard a story that he, he was saying that, that uh, I guess he was praying. He didn't know how he was going to pay the guys. And, and somebody just happened to find some money in, in somebody's house that passed away and they donated all that money. It was like, God, like blessed him and he was able to pay, but he was struggled to pay, but you know, his intentions always been like 100, you know, and, and and, you know, it's sad that maybe he had to turn away some people back then, but I'm glad that it expanded to what it was because, you know, I know he's a great man. I love him. I call him Pops. I call him my, my, my dad. I never had a dad. He's like the closest thing to a dad to me. And I love that man with all my heart. Yeah, I he's a great man, dude. I give him all the props in the world, man. So, Father Greg, if you're watching this. <laughs> he, he's a great man. I've met him a yes, few times. Is. I've had conversations with him. Great man, uh, he's got something great going on there. But you know what? That all came from you guys. At yeah. Least. Hey, hey Sonny, you know one thing about Father Greg, and I never forget this, is that every year, even though he's so busy, he's a busy man. I mean, he's so busy, but he never forgets my birthday. Never. Even if I was in prison or wherever I was at, I'd either get a letter or a text. Now he's texting. He always texts me, "Happy birthday, son." I love you, and and he never forgets. And he has this busy schedule. It's like, how does he remember this? You know, like he doesn't forget me. Out of all the people that he knows, he doesn't forget my birthday. And and I, I that means a whole lot to me. I appreciate that because that means that he cares. You know, I've seen, I've I heard stories of people that I know from uh, that that's gotten close with him. Um, that they parole, mess up, they go to a joint, they come out, they come to him, and he's like, here, go buy yourself some clothes. Oh yeah, he he comes out of his own money and everything to help all the kids out there. He, you know, what I mean, he's dude. You don't I, find people like that. Yeah, he helped. He he helped me a lot of times, a lot of times. I can't even count. Yeah, he's he's a great man. I had nothing but great um, stories from people about him, and and it was exactly what you said about um, guys that didn't have a father. They saw him as a, a, a father figure. You know, and um, I got the opportunity to interview Hector Verdugo. Oh, yeah, yeah, from Hazard. Yeah, yeah. Wow. and I got to talk to him and, and interview him and just nothing but great things to say about Father uh, Boyle. And it was Father Greg, and it was, like, just great to hear that. You know what I mean? And he's not the only one. Other people have told me um, the same similar stories about him. So it's great to hear that uh, people are out there doing the right thing. You know, and that's why I want to honor him with this video. I mean, it's yeah. going to be all about him, the lyrics I'm going to write of it. I mean, I know him so well, so it's going to be an easy song to write, but yeah. I'm yeah. going to try to make this one a, a, one of the best ones that I can because I want, I mean, I, I ain't got the money to pay him back, 
but I want to pay him back to, to pay him some homage for what he's done. And, and I, I want to honor him with this song. That way he can feel, you know, we have this legacy. We'll have this legacy in this video to always look back and, and say, you know, show how great of a man he is, you know? Yeah, I'm sure uh, uh, by Father Greg just seeing the person you are today is payment enough, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, he knows, he knows. He, he's gotten so mad at me, like, oh, I, 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 there's so many stories that, like, he got me a job and I messed up. And but you know what? He never gives up on me. He never gives up. He just, he, he just has this compassion and love for us, you know, and kinship, you know, he, 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 he doesn't want to throw people away. You know, that's what he says. He says, you know, we got to stop throwing people away just because we're gang members and all that stuff. We're humans, you know, we're human beings. And he recognizes that he sees the good in us. He doesn't just see the bad because yeah, yeah we were bad and we were able to do all this bad stuff, but father Greg sees the good in us and he doesn't give up. And he gives us that, that love that we need, you know, that love and respect and that, he shows you, he shows you what true love is. And, and, and that's why I love him with all my heart. I love that man. You yeah. know, it gives me a little bit emotional to think about it, but I, I mean, I, I can't express it enough how much I love Father Greg. Yeah, it's hard to find people that give you that unconditional love. You know what I mean? From their heart, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a true love and like relationship that they give you from their heart. You know what I mean? Not because they have to, but because they connect with you and they want you um, um, in a godly way. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's really good. That's really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Do you have any favorite, like, uh, stories that, that um, Father Greg uh, expresses? Because some of his stories I've heard, they are really vivid and um, heartfelt. He has a way with words like, like I've heard nobody else. Um, yeah, actually, actually, it was a recent one that I don't know if you've been seeing it on TikTok or, but I've seen it on YouTube when he's talking about when one of the guys got beat up really bad and he couldn't recognize them. And um, uh, two, two guys were, were enemies and they had to work together. And at first, they didn't want to talk to each other. And Father Greg told him, you know, if you want to work here, you're going to have to find a way to get along with him. And if, and if you, if you can't find a way to get along with them, then we got a hundred and something more people that are at that door wanting this job. So I guess he actually told Father Greg, all right, I'll, I'll work with him, but I'm not going to talk to him. So later on, you know, throughout the time that they're working with each other, these two enemies became friends because uh, in the story, Father Greg is saying um, they become friends. So one of the guys uh, I, I don't want to, I think it's Puppet. I think his name was Puppet. He was walking home or something and he got beat up really bad to where he, he was going to die. And uh, the other person who became Puppet's friend, I believe it's Puppet. I want to don't, don't um, say it, that name, but that the other guy called Father Greg and said, I heard what happened to so-and-so. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything I could do for him? He was not my enemy. He was my friend. It's, can I give him my blood? Can I, can I do something for him? Because he's my friend. And that's what Homeboy Industries is about. And that story that he tells, it, it like, now I'm getting a little teary-eyed. And, and it, it, it touches me. It touches me because, you know, now that I'm a man of God and I love the Lord, now I'm a man of God. I, 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 I wish I can go to my enemies and, and tell them, you know, even though I've done wrong and I've done wrong to you guys or, or people I sold drugs to, to just say sorry and that I love you and, you, and you're my friend. And I, I get inspired by what Father Greg does. And that story, like, really inspires me, you know. And, and I hope I'm not looking weak when I'm crying. It's just that I, I'm so passionate yes. about the Lord right now. And, I'm passionate about about everything that's going on in my life, and 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 I want people to know that, that that people can change, and people could don't have to live this life, and don't have to suffer the way I suffered, the PTSD and and the stressing of, of people gonna kill me every day, like every day, Sonny, uh, and Paul, and Joe, I I I, I, saw, I think somebody's gonna kill me, and 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 I know it's not true, 
but it, it, you know, I got so affected by this this life that it, I'm always paranoid. I'm always paranoid, and I need help. I need help for for this problem that I got. So, but but in that same token, I got the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's He's helping me. He's helping me to defeat this and put the devil behind me and and spread the word and, and talk to my enemies and whoever else that, that wants to hear it. I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing to go and talk to them. Yeah, I don't think you're weak for, for showing emotions, homie. I think uh, you're probably stronger than most by being willing to do that. A lot of us, uh, including myself, um, mask a lot of the what we feel. You know, and I, I know what you feel about somebody wanting to kill you or that's what you think because in reality, some of us have done things and we pass a line that we can never go back from. And they have relatives, they have family, they have friends that are never going to forget. And we're always going to have to watch our back over that. You know what I mean? Whether we're, we're living the good life or not, we're always going to have to watch our back because we got our families that we got to care about and take care of. I agree with on, you. homie. I don't think you're weak. I think you're being stronger than most. Thank you. By taking that mask off and, and showing these people that uh, we're not just animals. We actually got hearts and we actually feel things and, and we go through um, life and, and deal with the best we can, but we do have emotions. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. That's man, like, uh, that's not weakness. I think that's more being more man, being more of a man and more strong than, than the average person out there, you know what I mean? To be able to show your emotion and wear your heart on your sleeve. Yeah, that that's a real man to me. That, that, that's that's, that's from the love of God, Joe. Yeah. God showed me all this because I, I didn't have these emotions before. I didn't I didn't care about anything, Joe. I wasn't I didn't fear anything. You know, I didn't care. And and since I've been following God, it's like all these different emotions that are coming out and, and uh, I'm just I'm just excited. I'm excited and I'm ready to work for him. That's good. That's a good thing right there. I'm proud of you. Very proud of you. Very proud of the person that you've become. Um, proud of all of us right here, man, in this group. And uh, we have a lot of years of, uh, between us four, we got a lot of years of game banging and uh, doing wrong. And, um, but you know what? We're, we're all on the right path. We're all doing the right thing now. And um, if we could do a video like this and talk and to just to discourage the youngsters or even older guys to let them know that, hey, you don't have to continue on this path. You know what I mean? You don't have to stay in this life of gang banging and staying in your in your barrio. I mean, there's a whole new world out there. There's a, there's, there's a whole world out there that you don't have to be, you know, with your back against the wall, acting hard all the time. Um, worried about getting killed or, or worrying that you're going to have to kill, you know, um, man, you know, Jesus loves you and he's ready to forgive you and to give you, a, make you a whole new person and uh, a whole new creation in his image and um, live a life of without that, you know what I mean? And uh, the PTSD, we just got to keep stay forward and ask God. And sometimes the PTSD stays maybe to keep us grounded, you know what I mean? To, to remind us that you know, of the, some of the stuff that we went through. So that way we don't start straying or backsliding, you know what I mean? And, um, but uh, the way I always figure, God doesn't give us more than we can handle, you know? Sure. Yeah, for sure. I, so, I, got, uh, I got one question. Yeah. I got one question, uh, Dino. I was wondering, um, I've never really heard it explained, bro. And to go rewind a little bit. I know we've been, we're going forward to already when you're doing good, but if you could explain the federal case, the federal case, how it was, and how did you get, like, uh, you know, how was it going to jail? Because there was some big players in that case, you know, and and uh, how did they deal with you? How did you go through it with them? And, man, how did you get out of that? What was the outcome of that? I never heard it explained, and that's a big case, bro. Yeah. If you do that, that, that would be cool, bro, before we move on to your new life, you know? Yeah, well I'll talk about, uh, you know, my, my case only and personal. So I got caught, um, uh, for, for gun sales and, um, they were watching, watching me for like four or five years. And, uh, somebody came to my house and, uh, you know, a gun was sold. And, um, the guy who came with the other partner of mine, 
he was a, a snitch. So he was wired and uh, he bought this, this firearm from me and, and, and that's how they got me. But, you know, five years later is when they did a big old raid and they got a, a lot of us. They got a, a whole bunch of us. So um, I ended up going to the feds and um, I ended up getting like, one of the best, um, best uh, attorneys ever. Like his name was for dose. And um, I, when he first met me at the, at the federal jail, it's kind of funny how we met because he, he, I couldn't really see him. It was kind of dark. And um, he told me, yeah, hey, do you know I'm your attorney, blah, blah, blah. And then he's, uh, my name is Ferdos. And I was like, what? what? What's your name? He's like, Ferdos. And I go, I, I don't understand. I, I can't understand your name. Uh, and he was like, it's like if you're buying a pair of pants. How much are those? How much are for those? So that's how I got his name. So that's a little joke he tried to say. But so I ended up getting one of the best attorneys, you know, for 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 that type of crime because it was like he dealt with a lot of uh, big crimes like Rico acts and and he and he was like one of the best because I was hearing stories about this guy in there and I just happened to get him and this was like a state of uh, a federal attorney uh, uh, like the, the feds state paid for it or state attorney. Appointment. Yeah, so I was I was I was fortunate to get him. So um, um, they didn't want to release me, uh, you know, uh, on bail because the feds work a little bit different. So they didn't want to release me. But um, after a, a few weeks in there, um, I don't know how he did it, but we had to get like so many people. It was like so many millions of dollars to bail me out, and everybody had to sign. So we got everybody to sign these papers, and they they did. And part of the deal was that I immediately had to have a job. Um, it was like I was on probation already. They were going to monitor me. I had like three um, um, people um, looking at me and, and watching me. And um, it was just horrible because like every job I would go to, they would show up and search my car and do all this stuff. So I did get out on bail and I fought for maybe a year and a half, uh, fought the case. And and I don't know if you guys also know, and, and the fe federal federals um there used to be a a, a scale of, of your crime it wasn't just the crime that you were fighting so it, it used to be mandatory wherever you land on that scale is the time you're gonna get so say um your initial charges for guns and you land here but then you had prior cases which they still count against you all your priors count against you so it goes by a point system so however high that point system works, that's wherever you land, wherever that lands and how many years you got right there, that's what you're gonna get. So back then it was mandatory for the judge to follow those guidelines. Fortunately, I don't know how, I, you know, to me, I know how, it was the power of God. Um, they had just stopped that mandatory guideline. So around the time when I was gonna get sentenced, um, I decided just to plead guilty. I'm going to plead guilty for this charge. And, and, and I was looking at from 10 to 15 years because of the guideline. It just depended on the judge if she wanted to give me the whole 15 or um, the 10. So um, my attorney was like, look, you know, if you plead guilty, if you don't plead, you know, the, the, the story, if you, if you don't plead guilty, I mean, if you plead guilty, I mean, if you don't plead guilty, you're going to get the max sentence, which could be up to 20 years or you know, you know, the highest term or whatever she wants to give you. But if you plead guilty, we're going to try to go for at least four to five years. So I was like, man, that sounds better than, 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 you know, 10 to 15 years. So, um, I go, and this is only going to be for me. I'm not going to court for anybody. I'm not speaking on anybody. This is just for me. If you want me to go and, and testify and do this other stuff, it ain't going to happen. I told him it ain't going to happen. Because first of all, I don't even, I told him, I don't even remember the day happening because I was such an alcoholic. You guys, uh, I would drink during the week and, and, and sometimes I wouldn't remember things that happened and stuff, you know, and, and that's really one of the days that, that I don't remember, you know, the actual day of the sale of the, the, the firearm. So I told him, look, either way it goes, I don't know, you know, really what happened that day. So if you're trying to get me to go, you know, to go on the stand and do all this stuff, it's not going to happen. He goes, no, we're going to fight for your case only. Your case is separate from everybody else's, and this is just for you. You plead guilty to this, we're going to go for four to five years. It's not a promise. 
but that's what you're going to get. So I said, you know what? I'll take it. You know, I'll take it. They, they had me on recording. They got my voice and everything. There was no way I was going to win. You know, I would have been really dumb if I tried to fight it. So, you know, I had to think about my daughter, my daughter, Jasmine, and my son, Michael. I had to think about them. Be like, you know, I'm too old to be going to prison and doing all this time. You know, I'm already at a later age of my life. And I was already wanting to change my ways already. You know, when this happened to me, I was already starting to go to church. And, and but, you know, five years prior, this happened. And so what happened was is that, so we went to court. I already knew that I was going to get four to five years. And I was willing to go to jail that day. I already made my plans. I, I put my money away. I gave it to my people. And I told them, you know what? I want to start my time as soon as I get um, sentenced. Because I want to get started, go to prison, get it done, and, and get out. And, um, like, it's going to be that easy. But, yeah, I wanted to do that. And um, so we went to court. And, you know, we all prayed. And all my family, people that that, that, that were on my team, like my, my comadre Gina and my friend Walter and, and, you know, my mom, my brother, everybody was there. So we go to court and I was so nervous. You know, I had all these letters from Father Greg, like I told you guys before, from Celeste Freeman and all kind of people wrote these letters. You know, like I said, they knew that I was trying to change already, you know. I wasn't all there yet because I was still struggling with, you know, my past. But so we go to court and I don't know if you've been to the federal court, man, it is spooky. It's, it's like, it's just out of a movie scene. It's just an eerie feeling when you go in there. When they take you under the tunnel? Uh, yeah, it's just so eerie. It's just like, I, I just didn't like the way it looked. I just felt yeah. like I was doomed. Yeah, so right there when they take you under the tunnel, it's scary. Just yeah, so, yeah. So I'm in front of the judge. Uh, well, actually, I'm sitting down, and, and uh, my attorney, he's talking for me. I mean, this guy is, was great. He was, like, talking for me, and... And for those who just saying all the good things about me and, and, and even about, you know, he knows he made this mistake. He just, he just, the closing arguments were like unbelievable. Like, you know, it was just unbelievable. It was so great that, that um, the judge um, asked me uh, to speak to if I wanted to say something. My attorney actually told him that I wanted to say a few words. So I did, I, I got up there and, and, and I got emotional and, and I told her, look, I'm ready for whatever you're going to give me today, Your Honor. I know that I'm at fault for what I did. I, I take full responsibility. And, and this is not just something that, that you hear every day. Because every day they hear that, oh, I take responsibility. But in reality, a lot of these people don't. You know, they don't take responsibility. They're saying it because they want to get out. And that's just the, the true facts. But the truth was that I really meant it. I was ready to go do my time. I was ready to go hit the feds. I was ready to follow God because I had made a promise to God the night before. I said, no matter what, whatever happens tonight, I mean, tomorrow morning, Lord, I will follow you. I will follow your word and I'm going to be a true man of God. And, and this is my new beginning. This is going to be my new beginning, no matter what happens. Even if I got the 20 years, I'm going to follow you. Now I will walk with you no matter what anybody says. If it takes my life, I am going to walk with you, and that is it. My mind is set. I'm set already. So I kind of told the judge that. I told her, you know, how I was speaking to some young gang members and stuff, how I was trying to, like, start, you know, talking to them and, and teaching people uh, uh, about my life and stuff. And, you know, I told her the whole nine yards. They, they, wrote, they wrote a whole, like, uh, biography about my, my life story. And, and so she read it. So she kind of knew where I came from and, and – and, you know, the, the tragedies that I've seen and the people I've lost and, 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 and not making an excuses for my actions, but for things that we grew up in and things that we saw, just like, you know, Paul and, and Joe and you, Sonny, you know, you, you know, we can't blame it on those things, but it's a part about the way our life turned out because, you know, we grew up in that environment. And, and I told her, that, I told the judge that I even like broke down crying and, and told her that I'm sorry. And, and but I was, you know what, she knew that I was sincere, you know, it wasn't a fake, it was the truth, what I was saying, because I was, you know, Sonny, like I said, I was ready to go that day, I was ready, it was no doubt in my mind that I was going to get the four to five years, at least that on the low term, you know, I was hoping for that, you know, and I don't know why I felt confident that I was going to get that, and I was, I was satisfied with it, I was good with it, and I, I, I made my peace with God, and I'd say, you know what, I'm going to, 
Let's go and do this. Let me go and do this time and get back to my family and walk with the Lord and, and change my life and stop living the way I was because it was just like a revolving door of my life. I, I do, it was like a Groundhog's Day. I, my life would be one way and then it was like steps to my life there. Then it would end with a girl and then the same thing. It was just over and over, the same life. And I got tired. I got so tired of uh, of being shot at and, and, and cops looking for me and them raiding my house and and I mean, it was like several times where the cops would come and get me. So after I, uh, I spoke, you know, my, my piece with the, with the judge, um, the judge was like, so she looked at the DA and told the DA, uh, so um, do you have any closing arguments in the case of Mr. Aguilar? And, and this man did not stand up at all. He didn't stand up. He just like, like the way I'm leaning on the chair, he just leaned and like, nope. Like he had nothing to say. Like he did not want me to go to prison, and yeah. the, because the, the judge had said, um, "How are we going to put this guy back in the lion's bin? How are we going to put him back if he's doing so well? You know, he's doing so well, and if we put this man back in prison, and especially in the feds, I mean, that was an exact words, but how are we going to do this to this man and corrupt him again? We we just can't do it. We need to take a chance on this man." And this is what she said. She said, look at Mr. Aguilar. I'm going to take a big chance on you. And you are not going to prison today. And I'm like, I didn't say anything, but I'm sure she see my facial expression. Like, what? Like, where am I going? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, she said, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put you on high control federal um, uh, probation because it's not parole, it's probation. You're going to be watched like really strong. We're going to be on you. We're going to give you all these hours of community service. You need to speak to these young kids and these gang members of hours of community service. You need to uh, uh, do all these hours of, of um, actual community service to go work. Uh, we're gonna put you on a, a, a 16 month house arrest or 18 month program, something like that for house arrest. Um, you have to drug test. Uh, you're gonna be called um, on call. I don't care what you're doing, you're on call. Uh, automatic pop-ups, you cannot leave anywhere. It was just like a jail within my house. And, and that's what I got. I never had to you know, talk about anybody. I took the case of my own. They separated my case from myself. And I took my rap and that was it. And by the blessing of God, I went home that day. Wow. And that was because of God. And, and you know what, Sonny and, and Paul and Joe, I know I, I knew I already believed in God because since a kid, God was calling me because there used to be a school, a, a school bus that used to come and pick us up. It was called First Fundamental um, Bible Church in Monterey Park. And they used to pick us up, all project kids, and the truth was, I used to go to go eat because they used to, you know, feed us all there. So I used to go get a free lunch, but I knew at the time that God was calling me. So come to the day of court, when I didn't get that time, I knew then. I knew then, you guys, that that was my new beginning. I knew that that was my start. I knew that my life was going to change that day. Even though there's, there's still struggles, I struggle every day and I'm not perfect. I sin every day and I ask God because I know I feel the... The, 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 the feeling inside, you know, that bad feeling of, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. Or I get angry. You know, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a saint. I still get mad when people do things to me and, and I get angry and I get these bad thoughts, you know, and I got to tell God. And, and like Joe told me the other day, he, he helped me do this. He tells me, put God, tell God to put the devil, rebuke the devil. And that's what I do because I still get angry. I still get these thoughts. It's not going to change who I was because I still got those emotions. I still get angry. I'm still a man, but I got to remember that God's first and that God loves me and that God loves us all and that God's going to protect us and keep us away from the devil and keep us away from those bad thoughts that we get from wanting to hurt people because I, I didn't care before to hurt anybody. It didn't bother me at all. It didn't bother me, you know, you know, and so now I feel these emotions and, and, and that day was my beginning. That was yeah. my beginning of my new life. And, it's, it's been a rocky road. It's been hard and I, I, I sin and fall, but I get back up and I, I still fight. I fight for the, the word of God and for all you guys and for my, for all the people, you know, all, all the people that I know, even my enemies, I love them all. And I, I don't want, 
any bad to anybody. And I just want everybody to know that, that I love them all. No matter if you did something to me or I did something to you. And I beg everybody for forgiveness for what I've done. And especially to the Lord for, to forgive me for my sins. Yeah. And once you ask God to forgive you, um, you're forgiven. You know what I mean? And you're like a new man. You know what I mean? And God doesn't remember or ever bring you back up the past of, the, of your sins. You know what I mean? Yes, and, sir. Yeah. And it's harder to say that about people here on earth because people that hear that don't believe in God, don't walk with God, you know, it's hard for them. Even the ones that do walk with God, it's hard to find forgiveness, you know, but um, that's why we strive and we push forward every day. Cause I'm not perfect. I have the same issues you have every day. You know what I mean? But the difference between Dino, Joe and Sonny and Paul is that we might get these thoughts. We might get these feelings, we don't, we don't act on them like we used to. We don't snap like we used to. And that, to me, that's the Holy Spirit in us that, that teaches us like between right and wrong and, and reacting, you know, like we used to. We used to fly off the handle and, and take care of business. Now we like, we think about it. And it's not about being like, um, it's, not a, it's not even being a coward or being scared or any of that stuff. It's about what, our, what we believe in, you know what I mean? Our religion about being, you know, uh, loving God and, and asking him to forgive us of our sins and us forgiving those that have trespassed against us, you know? And so that's why we don't fly off because it's the Holy Spirit that's holding us back. Like, nah, man, even though you feel it, but you're like, no, because it's wrong. You know what I mean? You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to you react like that. Like, if, if this, this person does wrong to you, you're like, okay, you know what? I forgive you. You know what I mean? God bless you. And I, I don't hold no ill it will against you, you know what I mean? And then just carry on with your day and pray and ask God, you know what I mean? To keep you pushing forward and moving forward. And that's it's, it, that's one of the, the battles that I have is, is to walk away. And I do it every day, but it's so hard. It's so hard, Joe. It's so hard. Sometimes like I, I, I get shaky and, and, and I, I pray. Sometimes I break down in the car. I feel like, you know, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have backed off. But, but then I realize, you know what? God loves me, man, and, and, and there's a reason I'm feeling this inside. There's a reason why I'm feeling like, don't do it. Like, it's because God's love, and, and, and everybody can have that feeling. It's free. You don't, have to, you don't have to earn it. It's given to us. He gave it to us when he died on the cross for us. He shed his blood for us. So yeah. it's for free. You don't have to do anything. God tells you to come as you are. Come broken. He looks for the broken. Who did God hang around with? With prostitutes and all these people because he was looking for them to save them. And, and, and that's what he does for us now. So if you're broken and you're watching this podcast, trust me, you come as you are. And if you ever need us, we're here for you. And, 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 and God loves you with, with wholeheartedly. He, you're his kid, his son. And, and he died for us. And we need to remember that. I have a, a question for basically all you guys yes sir said something right now dino that resonated with me you said i can't believe i did that in your little little rant right now you said i can't believe i did that you know um when i first paroled i was at my brother's um we were watching tv something came out of the news and they showed some video of something that happened and I was like, man, that guy's a fool. Look at what this guy did. And my brother looks at me. He goes, you did the exact same thing. And, and for the life of me, it took a while to, to, I did do the exact same thing. And I just wasn't me that did it. It wasn't like um, something changed in me that I couldn't even see myself doing that anymore. Um, you guys go through the same thing? Oh, yeah. I do. I do too. I do too. I. It's like a whole different person did it. Yeah, I walked away from things that in, in my I don't was my past. I wouldn't have walked away from those. I would have went heads up with it, you know. And there's things that I walk away from, or I choose to take the higher ground. You know what I mean? And I, I know it's the Holy Spirit in me because be, back in the day, um, the what I always say, the old Joe, the lost Joe, just would have snapped and went off and whatever you know but now you know i know it's the holy spirit that's in me because there's some stuff that 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 i take that i'm like man when it did this before you know what i mean 
but still you walk with God, you have the Holy Spirit and it's still, it's hard to swallow, man. I'll be honest. You know what I mean? There's a lot of times where like, you know, say you sit in the car and you're like, I should have, would have, could have, man. But you have to realize that it's not, it's not a slow reaction. It's not, you know, you did the right thing. You listened to that Holy Spirit that kept you from getting into trouble. You know, gotta put this on Joe. Yep, the full bottle, the full uh, armor of God. Yeah, that's what we gotta put on every day. Every day. I think this has to be uh, the best podcast I've been part of. Yeah, it feels good. You can feel it. And yeah. I'm, I'm honored for you guys to have me, Paul and, and Sonny and Joe. I'm honored. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have all you guys, man. You know, and I can say that me, I love you guys, man. I love you guys like like I brothers, do, man. man. You know, yeah. I, I feel like a bond with you, Vatos. And you guys know I've told you all in, in your each individually, you know, alone. I told you guys how I feel about you, Vatos. You guys are solid, man. And, um, you know, I'm here for you guys anytime, you know. And um, like I said, you sh- I, I know you guys are like my brothers, man. That's for sure. Well, I need an extra stimulus check, homie. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. Hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah don't worry. I, hey, look at Bobo. Yeah. <laughs> Biden, he's, he's going to shoot it down to you, dog. Don't worry, doc. You got to come and you got to come and just, just shoot me your social security number, huh? So I can claim you on my taxes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I need an extra dependent. <laughs> No, nah, you um hey, you know what I wanted to know? And it was uh I I maybe you touched on it. When did you leave or how did you leave the projects? Well, I, I left the projects uh when they tore them down. Oh, so you were one of the ones that got evicted. Yeah. So they tore them down and we were gone. So I moved end up moving to Whittier and I call that like my second home, Whittier. And I stood out there for the rest of you know, you know, until I moved out here where I'm at now. So. Yeah, a lot of people got evicted, and uh, they managed to get out of that 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 um war zone. Yeah, That's exactly what Elisa was was a straight war zone. Yeah, I remember there was times where like my best friend Green Eyes, because he, he he drank a lot too, a great fighter, but he drank a lot. And I remember there was times where they were shooting, and I would have to get, go in the middle of the thing to go get them, you know. And it was like really running into a battlefield. It was like horrible. You know, and, and a lot of my homies, you know, they, you know, they held it down. And, and thank God we didn't lose more than what we lost, you know, because we were the smallest ones there, you know. And but, you know, thank God we didn't lose. We lost a lot, but we didn't lose what people would have thought, you know, for us being so small. But Greeny was one of the ones that I have to save him. And he also saved me. And yeah, it was just a war zone. I remember I got spared one time. And this is a story I haven't told you, Joe, but I was out front in my apartments in the projects and that that was on Glass Street. And um, I was outside with my my then girlfriend, Roberta, my kid's mom, my son's mom, and her friend Eva, my my homie pirate, Danny, rest in peace. And um, we were sitting in the car and my apartment was like literally behind us. So this car pulled up, this was like early night, this car pulled up and they just jump out and I wasn't strapped or anything because I was at home. I felt safe there, but you know, I should have known better. And these guys jump off. So keep in mind in our buildings, in the projects, if you go up one stairway, there's no entrance to the roof. It's just like a dead end. But if you go to the other side of the project to that same stairway, my same um, unit, you can go to the roof. So when these guys jumped out, they chased some of the other homies that were to the left of us. And then, Two of them chased uh, my friend um, Danny. They left my girl, my ex-girl and, and, and her friend alone. And then they chased me up my stairs. So when I ran upstairs, my plan was to go up on the roof and then take off the other way. And, but that didn't happen because I ran up to the spot where it was a dead end. So as I ran up, he was still, I could still hear him downstairs running up the stairs. But when I got up to the top, I was like, oh, man and i could hear him coming up the stairs because the stairs went in a circle and i could hear him and i just crawled up in the ball i mean i'm getting chills thinking about it right now but i crawled up in the ball sunny and i'm just waiting for it i knew that that was that was the end of my life i already knew he was going to come and shoot me in the head so 
well, as I'm in the ball, I hear it closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And then I look up expecting the shot. And it was a childhood friend of mine who lived it literally, his brother's the one that died in my car. His brother died in my car. Um, but he ended up becoming from a gang from up the hill. So he ended up being our enemy, but that's where his family lived. But when he seen me, he pointed the gun ready to shoot me. He was ready to shoot me. I could see it. I already, I was like, I was just going to take it and just look at him in his eye. I wanted him to see me. Not that I was a shooter, but I wanted him to see me. You know, and when he was going to shoot me, he took a double look. And he just put the gun down and ran back downstairs. He ran back downstairs and then I could hear him shooting over there. Blah, 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 blah. He spared me. Man, see. Spared me. Yeah. Man, God's good. Protect you, man. That's what you call that blanket of protection. I mean, there's so many stories that I can tell, like about, you know, my situation. I'm sure a lot of my homies got a lot of stories too. You know, I'm not the only one that's been through it. Like you and Joel, Paul and, and, and Sonny, we all been, we got our stories, but like, those are just like, I got many stories of, of things that happened to me, you know, so much stuff. It's like, it, it just, it's unbelievable, like how much stuff that one person can go, could go through. And I've been in, like many situations, and this is weird too, that where I get in situations where I either saved somebody's life or I'm jumping into a car where a car's almost on fire. Or like there was an instance at a Home Depot where this guy came out screaming from a bathroom and I'll keep it short. I was there with my daughter trying to find a part for my stove and this guy comes out screaming, help me, help me. And then I'm like, I looked at my daughter. She was like maybe 11 years old at the time. And we're like, well, what's going on? And then the guy is screaming. So I run over there, me and my daughter run to the bathroom. And she goes, I can't help this man. He's on the floor and this and that. And, and my son's using the bathroom. I'm like, well, so I run into the bathroom. There's a guy on the floor having a seizure. He's like, you know, shaking. So, you know, in prison, you see that a lot. So I kind of knew what to do. So I ran in there. My daughter's watching this the whole time. And I put the guy to his side. I put my wallet in his mouth. And um, he starts foaming out of his mouth, right? And um, I'm trying to, like, keep him calm. And at that moment, after he starts foaming, his body just, like, stiffens up like a board. And for some reason, I knew this guy is dead. So when that happened, I put him on his back and I started screaming. For, at this time, people are coming and I'm screaming like, somebody help me. You need to get that thing. I can't give him mouth to mouth because of he's foaming at his mouth and all this stuff. And, you know, that thing that you put over, you know, I didn't know what to call it. And finally they came and, and the ambulance came and they, the cops held me there because they wanted to know what happened. They took my ID and all this stuff. And I told him I just walked in there and I was, you know, this is what happened. I heard it. And then, but the guy ended up passing away. You know, and, and he died right there with me, you know, and I've had uh, other situations like where my friend, little Joe, uh, uh, we, we got shot at again in the projects and I was getting dropped off and we were dropping somebody off and, and he ends up getting shot and I was shot. I got shot in the arm. Uh, I, you know, it's a long story for that one, but uh, we ended up getting pulled into a, a, an apartment in the projects, the new projects at that by our enemies who shot us, but the older generation, they helped us, which is uh, my friend, Mikey, I told you about him before, his family members and they were from the other side and they actually saved us and, and drug us in there. And at that time, my friend, little Joe, he got shot up here in the shoulder, which hit an artery. So he was squirting blood out. I was bleeding all over my arm, uh, but he was squirting. So me and him ended up on the couch and I'm, I'm hugging him. And at the same time, I got my finger and I stuck it inside of his chest. So I got my finger inside of his chest. And he just was squirting out, but I noticed that it was going less and less. And he, he was like getting so pale and he was like moving his head, telling me, Dino, are you going to die? Are you going to die? I mean, am I going to die? Am I going to die? And I'm like, no, man, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. And I kept slapping him with the other hand, like hitting him. Wake up, Joe, wake up. And and I was like, please, Joe, just stay up. Stay up, man. You're not going to die, bro. You're not going to die. And he just kept bleeding. And then finally the, the paramedics came and he survived. He survived that gunshot. And the, they said, be, because I put that, I stopped some of the bleeding. And by the time they came, they, they, they saved them. And then we all, we both got sent to the hospital. I ended up running out of the hospital because 
an LAPD came, a guy that we grew up with in the project, he ended up becoming an LAPD. So I don't know if he saw my name or what, but he ended up going to the, the hospital where my girl works at and, and, and try to question me. And I pulled out the IVs. I started running. They started chasing me around the hospital and <laughs> I got away. I got away and I was still bleeding, holding my arm. I ended up at the Jack in the Box, you know, by the uh, mission, by, by the coroner's office. Yeah. I ended up by the Jack in the Box and I was a little tipsy and holding the blood in. And I went to the drive through and told the guy, hey, if I don't eat something right now, I'm going to die. And they gave me free burgers. I'm eating burgers right there. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you should have went down the street to Dino's. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what happened. Free that food, you might have hit Dino's, man, <laughs> or Wendy's, one of them. So they fed me. They fed me in the drive-through and Jack in the Box till my ride came, and yeah, that's what happened. Well, I think that um, growing up in that life, you know what I mean? Um, they could we call the PTSD and all that helped us prepare us like uh, to be able to respond better to things that happen. You know, like. Or some people might freeze when they see somebody shot or somebody having a seizure. Um, I think the stuff we went through, it just helps us to respond a lot faster and, and, and maybe have like uh, more of that, uh, uh, what do you say, like um, that reaction time is just a lot better. Hey, you know what? And, and I think people see that in, in people like us because there was a time too, I was doing a show with Sugar Free and a, a couple other artists at a place called The Green Turtle. And Another friend of mine, I don't want to say his name, but he ended up, I don't know if it was old Dean or what on PCP or whatever it was he was doing. I, I don't want to say too much, but um, I'm inside of the club, keep in mind, ready to perform. And this guy's over here going out and he couldn't breathe or something. And why, tell me why people come in running, calling me, you know, this guy's like, what? Like, well, why are you calling me? Why aren't you guys doing anything about it? So I ran, you know, of course I ran out like the superhero I thought I was and ran out and, and um, he's sure enough, he's on the floor. So I take out my shirt. I don't know why I took out my shirt, but I took out my shirt and I started, and he had a big Rosha like you. So I was like on him, giving him CPR and, and he was out and it wasn't working. People were telling him, man, he's gone, he's gone. And I didn't give up. I kept going and, and I gave him that last breath and all of a sudden he came up like, oh. <sighs> like a movie and he was alive <laughs> so I, I i got him to breathe again and then the crazy part about this story after we did the performance at, at that that place we had after hours in my house guess who's coming with beer <laughs> that guy i'm like dude did you have enough already man like <laughs> yeah yeah see yeah, yeah. Story. Dude, that was just the breeze just took a nap he just yeah. took a nap <laughs> well, you, know, you, know, you know i'm mm-hmm. gonna say the last word on uh, what you guys have to say i want to thank dino for coming on and, and it won't be the last one we're going to have other um interviews with you you know and uh okay. get to the, the rest of the story and stuff we have but, um, yeah let, let's talk about your song you're going to be releasing yeah so um i'm releasing this the, the, a new song of mine uh it's called my beginning it talks about the story that we we're talking about here um uh, just about me you know about you know how I started uh, my, you know, struggling with, you know, my addiction to selling drugs. I never did drugs, but I was surely addicted to selling them and the power and the, and the stuff. So it talks about, about that in the beginning of the song. And then it, it slowly, slowly talks about me going into the fence briefly. And then it starts talking about how I started hearing God's voice in my head and telling me that I, I'm not leaving you, son. I'm here for you. I'm not going to leave you. And, and how it, it convinced me to change my life and, and how I put on the armor of God and, and how, my, how I started walking with him and, 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 and praising him and letting people know. And like my brother Paul, my brother Paul Silent from, from Temple Street, he, uh, that's my stepbrother Paul, but I consider him my solid brother. Uh, and I, he started walking with the Lord. And I talk about how he was an inspiration to me also to see him walking with the Lord. Because, I mean, he was with it too. He was, you know, pretty solid. He's a solid guy, but he changed his life also. So I talk about him in the song and... And I tell people how God died for us and how he shed his blood for us to, 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 for forgiveness. And we don't, you don't earn your way to heaven because it's already given to you. You just got to receive him. And once you receive the Lord and you, you receive him in your heart and you know that he exists and you know that God is real, you are automatically saved and, and walk with him and do his work and, 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 and 
that's what the song is about it's to show people and not to glorify gangs and all this stuff none of this is to glorify any of that but it's to, to shed light on the problems of being in the gang and 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 the consequences the consequences they roll deep and especially if you lose a loved one to it you know it, it there's heavy consequences whether it's losing somebody or, or mental issues like that we we get from all of the ptsd and and all these other problems that come along with it, having to watch your back for the rest of your life. And people don't realize how hard that makes your life, you know, to live that way. And and and, and everything you guys are doing, Paul and Sonny and Joe, man, I'm sure everybody appreciates what you're doing. And, and I'm glad that you guys put this outlet so people can see and hear the truth because all this gang stuff, it, it, it's false. You know, it's maybe it gives you that sense of family and that sense of love, but you know what? God gives that too. God gives all that. Whether you, you can't see him, it's all about faith. If you got that faith in your heart and you strongly believe that God does exist, trust me, you will feel that love. You will feel that love and that, that admiration that God has for you and how he's going to welcome you into heaven when you do a good job for him. Man. And that's all that matters. You can love your family, love your family and take care of your families and your kids and, and never turn your back on them. But you need to love God and have that faith in him. Even though you don't see him, you pretend like he's right there. So when you're ready to do something wrong, always think this way. Think that God is standing there. Believe that he's standing there because the truth is it's good. he is standing there. And you always believe that he's there with you. And when you make those mistakes, you repent of your sin. And he forgives you. He throws that way far in the ocean. He never, he never remembers your sin. And know that it's real because my story Joe's story, Paul's story, Sonny's story, it's all true. And many of the homies that are out there, like my brother Paul, they're all true stories, and it's a real life. It exists, and it's true. We can change, and we're human beings, and like Father Greg says, it's about kinship, and we, let's stop throwing people away because we all matter. Everybody matters, no matter you're black, white, oriental, Indian, whatever. It doesn't matter. We are all one. We're one and we're all one and we're loved by the same God. And we all bleed red. And we will be in heaven if you believe. And that's all I got to say about that. Amen. 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 Sonny? Yes, sir. That's yeah. uh, You're right, homie. A lot of uh, people go uh, and get on and talk about uh, anti-gang, that they're not with it. But, um, but they're actually, in reality, they're glorifying it. They're not talking the truth. Uh, they might show their pictures or uh, them gang banging and talk about their homeboys and they're not really pulling a, a, a painting a real picture of what we had to go through or what you know most of most Tommy's gone through one way or another um so i commend you for for doing that you know what i mean and paul and joel they steady pushing that positive and and being real about it that makes me proud I mean, I love all my homies. I still keep in contact with them and I love them, you know, they're my family. And now that I'm following God, now I could come at them in a different way and see, see what I can do. You know, I have always, I would always love them. I, I love everybody and I love my homies. Yeah, I love my homeboys. I, I love my neighborhood. I'm, I love where I'm from. I love my homeboys. Just. I know where this life leads and, and I'm doing my best to, to help people not be involved in it. Exactly. I'm not going to, I'm not going to downgrade them or talk bad about them or because we've all been there and we know what they're going through. Yes, sir. What they feel like they have to prove. We that's understand. how God is using us. Yeah. So it's, you know, I love my homeboys. I love where I'm from. It's just, but it's, yes, it's sir. not about killing anybody anymore. It's about uh, trying to coexist with each other. Yes, sir. Yep. I agree. Amen to that. Paul? No, just thank you, Dino, for, for being here. And uh, we'll definitely have you on again, man, and have him on the round table and, and other things. And uh, we still got a lot more to talk to you about in another time, Dino, like uh, sure. Felipe Esparza, if he was from oh, the that's hood. my boy right there. Was he from the hood or no? Yeah, he was, he's from TMC. They, we called him Batman. Man. Really, he was. Yeah, I, I talked. I talked to Felipe to this day. Man, he was from TMZ. Yeah, he's from TMZ. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, he don't talk about that. Yeah, he actually he doesn't actually say the neighborhood, but if you go on YouTube, you'll see 
he's at a bar or something. He's telling his story about where I, he's from. I, I do remember that. Yeah, I do remember that. But yeah, uh, he's from TNC. Oh wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. and I uh, I talked to Felipe Sparks the other day, and he verified. Uh, Dino's one of his close homies. His, him and his whole family is uh, real close with uh, Felipe. He and actually played cool. my song on his podcast, Project Raise. Yeah. I recorded a song called Project Raise, and um, I don't know what episode. I'm still waiting. I'm kind of mad at him because he, he hasn't sent me the episode, but that's fine. But he yeah. actually played that song. He was excited that I wrote something about the project, and he uh, he played it on his podcast. I don't know which one, but I yet to see it. But, yeah, he said he did. Yeah, that's great. And you know what? Uh, what I want to say is that uh, Dino's song is great. And, um, man, he's got a lot of great music coming out with uh, with other artists. And um, it's going to be, you guys keep your eyes out. Uh, you're going to have a music video, right? Yeah, on March 27, we're going to be shooting the video in a, a certain area. If people want to find out, they can message you or however they want to get a hold. And it's for everybody, you know. And the whole point of, the, of shooting the video in a park is to get, tons of people together, people who are non-believers and they're believers, and maybe we can save some people that day. Well, actually, God, not us, but... Is this uh, the 20th? The 27th. Right? It'll be on a Saturday, March oh. 27th. I know there's another one happening on the 20th. Yeah, so we're uh, going to be shooting the, on that video, and then I got a lot of videos coming out. I just did a song uh, called A Letter to My Mama. I wrote it from prison, so that's another video I, I'm shooting, and I did it with a big artist, a pretty good big artist. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. If you guys want to join us on the 27th, um, direct message one of us. You guys can go to uh, my Instagram, which is the underscore official underscore Big Joe, and uh, hit me up, and, and I can send you the info. Or you can hit up Paul or um, Dino, Sonny, any of us. You can hit us up, and we'll all have some information about that day. Yeah. Um, it's all about positivity. It's all about God. It's all about that you can be forgiven of your sins. You can walk um, that that road. You know what I mean? That that righteous road. And, and uh, like I said, be forgiven and not have to worry about watching your back all the time or worried about um, overdosing or worried about getting shot or going to prison or being killed out there on those streets. So, um you know, you, you can change your life. You can change your life, but you got to want it. You got to want it from inside. And um, just thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. We, thank pleasure you. meeting you, Dino. You too, Sonny. I heard a lot of good things about you, my brother. Hey, gracias. I've heard the same about you, homie. Yeah, send my love to Gori. I will. I'll speak with thank her you. tonight, probably. Okay. Okay, everybody be ready. We're going to have another LA Times episode with Dino. Uh, we want you just to like, subscribe, let everybody know about um, this channel, let everybody know about what we talked about, and just get spread the news out there, spread the news there. Thank you all, and uh, God bless you all. Have a good night, you guys. Good night.